Well, hello everyone and welcome to uh, Calvary Chapel Pasadena's online children's church. Um, hope everyone's doing well and uh, we're going to continue going through our uh, series in the Old Testament. We're going to be going through 2 Kings chapter 12 uh, verses 1 through 19. So let's pray. Lord, we come to you in Jesus name. Lord, we just want to lift up our, our time here in the study. Lord, speak to our hearts. I pray for all the kids who are Sitting out there listening at home, Lord, that this would just be a time where we get to sit, listen to you, and you administer to us. We thank you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, um, again, as I was stating, we're going through um, 2 Kings chapter 12. And I just kind of want to share a story before we begin. You know, uh, Napoleon uh, Bonaparte um, was responsible for the death of over 500,000 of his Frenchmen. Um, in battle and approximately that's about one-sixth of their population um, he was exiled by the British to uh, the last six years of his life on the island of Mount I'm sorry of island of uh, st. Helena and um, his wife his wife never ever spoke to him again never wrote to him um, as a matter of fact uh, uh, she got remarried while he was still alive, uh, his son his never his son was never heard from again. He never saw him again. Um, and as he was exiled in this island, uh, he was only allowed to be on uh, on the grounds, uh, always with a British soldier. So he was never alone. Um, and so unfortunately, he was really alone. And when uh, when he died, when he finally uh, expired. When they buried him on his tombstone it said here lies that's all it said here lies they had they had never even put his name on the tombstone why why didn't they put his name on his tombstone well they didn't put his name on his tombstone because they didn't want to honor this man he was an utter failure as they were as far as they were concerned he failed them and so on his tombstone all it says is here lies and today we're going to look at a king uh, kind of similar in the sense of how his life began well, but unfortunately he, he ended his life in utter failure. And it really stands as a, a lesson for all of us of how we all desire to start well, and we, but we also want to finish well. We don't want to be failures in our life in that respect. We want to end well with the Lord. Um, so we're, today we're going to look at a king, and his name is Joash. Uh, again, he made bad decisions, decisions that utterly left to his failure. He started with good intentions. He, uh, as the scripture says, he, he uh, did things that were right in the sight of the Lord, but again, he, he, he eventually failed. Um, and maybe you're out there today. Uh, maybe you started well with the Lord. Um, you know, last year things are going great for you. You, you uh, are walking with the Lord. Your things are going great. There was joy in your life, but then things happen. And it could have been last month, last week. Uh, things are going great, and then uh, all of a sudden you're not trekking with the Lord anymore. Now you're just doing things uh, how you think they should be done, rather than the Lord directing you and leading you how you should live. Um, and again, this is kind of this story maybe for you. Um, but it's a great lesson for us that we would start well and end well and not end like Joash. We don't want to make the same mistakes he made. Though we're going to make mistakes in our life, that's that's true. We will make mistakes. But the real issue is do we get up and make right decisions from those mistakes? So uh, we'll start here in verse 1. It says, In the seventh year of Jehu, Joash became king and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibia of Beersheba. And Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord. All the days in which Jehoiada the priest instructed him. But the high places were not taken away. Take note of that guys. They weren't taken away and the people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Joash becomes king at the age of seven years old. Uh, I don't know about you know I don't know everyone's ages out there, but imagine if you were told 
as of right now, you are the queen or king. You are the head honcho. You are in charge of a nation. Now, I granted, there's some of you out there who may like the idea. You may like the fact, hey, I am the king now. That means, you know, when we think about what it means to be king, we think of liberty, right? I can... Uh, I can have what I want. I can eat what I what I want whenever I want. I can have as much fun as I want. Right? The king does what as he pleases. He he gets to do uh, as he he wants. Um, and some of you may be thinking that. Well, um, again, I'm not denying those benefits uh, about being a king, but there are two sides of the coin. Uh, there's also responsibility. The king he governed a nation. He he exacted laws he is responsible for the people the king also protected the nation he had to make sure his country was protected and that the army was strong so being a king wasn't exactly cake and ice cream uh do you think joe ash was ready at the age of seven to lead a nation uh i know if, if they told me you're going to be the king there is a burden there's a responsibility that comes with that uh, so he needed help and as he was growing up, it tells us here that Jehoiada, the priest, comes in. And he's the one who instructs him. And he begins to show him and teach him. And it, again here in verse 2, he's the one who, who gives him direction as he grows up uh, while he's alive. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Again, as I mentioned earlier, when Jehoiada was alive. There's a great accountability there. And there's going to be people in your life, folks, that will... Um, that will give you uh, uh, direction um, and you do those things around them and you're and you know they're there for accountability and that's great I had friends like that that in, in, even in the world when I didn't know the Lord there are some guys that actually were pretty good guys and they didn't want me to get in trouble um, but more importantly in the Lord are you that kind of individual do you go around in, encouraging your friends hey this is how we're supposed to to walk with the Lord we don't do those things we don't see those things and that that's who you want to be but you also want to surround yourselves around people that will do that for you as well and so uh, here in verse 3 it also tells us that, that at that time there were people who are worshiping other gods in the high places well what do you mean by that Fernando what do you mean high places well in Israel the high places were known as places where you would visit and worship other gods they light fires and worship other gods it was idolatry and Joash had the opportunity of ridding the land of idolatry but he he left this area open he should have taken care of it. unfortunately um, what we know of, of, of Jehoash is he doesn't do that and after Jehoiada dies that's when jo, uh, Jehoash uh, asks life takes a turn for the worst he, he begins to worship other gods. He turns from the God of the Bible. How do I know this? Well, it tells us in 2 Chronicles 24, uh, he begins to worship other gods. And kids, that's what uh, idolatry is. Uh, and that's what it does. It takes us from worshiping the true and living God, the God that does exist, to a God that is not even real. He's not even there. And there are many people in this world today who follow after false gods they're not real they don't they can't speak they can't hear they can't do anything and that's that's what that is it's 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 a false hope when we have a living hope we serve the true and living god he's real what's in your life that god's been speaking to you to get rid of is there something that's getting in the way between you and god is there something in your life that's substituting your time with the Lord. If there is, I'm, I tell you right now, get rid of it. It's not beneficial for you. There, there are things in my life I constantly have to always check to make sure that those things aren't crowding the Lord out. I want to make sure that I'm spending time in the Word, that I'm seeking the Lord. I, what I mean by seeking, I'm trying to hear God. I'm trying to sense His direction. Not just reading words on a page. These words in the scripture are alive so when i read them they speak to me this is when i think of the scripture it is the most valuable thing i think a person can possess on this planet not silver not gold not your bank account not anything you could think about video games whatever you put value in 
can't even compare it to the scripture. It is the most valuable thing you can possess. And notice here uh, in verses 4 and 5, it says, And Joahash said to the priest, All the money of the dedicated gifts that are brought into the house of the Lord, each man's census money, each man's assessment money, and all the money that a man purposes in his heart to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priest take it to them, each from his own constituency, and let them repair the damages of the temple wherever any dilapidation is found. Hey, right on, Jehoash. Uh, you're, you're doing the right thing here. And again, these are good intentions, right? Jehoash, he desired all the money that was coming into the temple to be used in repairing of the temple. The, the temple was in disrepair. It needed a, a, a facelift. It, uh, there were things that just needed to be repaired. The, the stonework, the woodwork. This is the place where, where God's people are supposed to meet. Uh, and what's interesting to me is the priests don't do that. They don't see that as important. And, and I have to ask myself, why? Why didn't they think that was important? Well, uh, we're going to see in a little bit, and I think we have some clues as to why. But Joash, he, he saw the importance. And again, this is where uh, the, the chief priest was instrumental in his life. He, he, he says, we're to take all the money and use it for the repairs. The, the place... The temple need a, a facelift that was long overdue. And remember what the temple was. It's not just a building. It's like a church building, right? It's, it's a building. But more importantly than that, it's where the people of God come. It's where they come in and are seeking to hear from the Lord. It's a place of prayer. A, a great place of just to, to pour your heart out into the Lord. And, and to find others who are like-minded in the Lord. It, it, the world doesn't offer that. Uh, God's sanctuary does so we know that the temple is a place where people came to meet God it was a focal point of Israel's worship and it was in bad it was in bad shape and notice in verses 6 through 8 here it says now it was so by the 23rd year of King Jehoash that the priests had not repaired the damages of the temple so King Jehoash called Jehoiada the priest and the other priests and said to them why have you not repaired the damages of the temple? Now therefore, do not take more money from your constituency, but deliver it for repairing the damages of the temple. And the priests agreed that they would neither receive more money from the people nor repair the damages of the temple. So again here, 20, 23 years have gone by and the priests haven't done anything. They haven't done any of the upgrades or any of the repairs. The priests were negligent. They didn't obey the king's recommendations and the temple again was in disrepair for over 23 years that's a long time 23 years and and the priests they didn't seem like uh, it was that important to them uh, they didn't take care of the things of god bad stewards uh, why does a king need to tell them this um, they should have done it themselves they should have been the ones uh, uh, to be uh, there and vocal about hey we need to take care of the temple not because it's just a building but it, what it represents a place for god's people to meet uh, it just tells me that god came second place to them you're talking wait are you saying that the priests the people who were supposed to represent god didn't value god that way yeah there are people today who abuse the people of god they abuse the things that god has given them um but the other thing that tells me uh, something about there's a something else in this passage that speaks to me is shouldn't have shouldn't Josh have noticed that you know after a few months that things weren't getting done? Why did it take 23 years for Joash to notice? For, you know we already know the priest didn't do anything, but why did it take 23 years for the king to notice? It tells me that Joash didn't go to temple. He was an attending temple. Otherwise, he would have looked around and would have asked questions. Why isn't this take, being taken care of? So it tells me that he didn't take his relationship with the Lord seriously. Or he had he really didn't have a relationship with the Lord. That's, that speaks volumes to me. Um, so again, here we have the king. He, he calls for Jehoiada and, and the priests and he confronts them. And rightfully so. Why haven't they done the repairs? And he instructs them that they're no longer taking any more of the money that's coming in for themselves, but use it for the repair of the building. Kids, uh, this is a good thing. Again, 
uh, Joe Hash was doing. It took 23 years, 23 years late, but but if the king hadn't put down his foot, the temple would continue to be in disrepair. And so this is a good thing. Again, it's a sad thing that those who are supposed to represent God didn't do a better job with the money that was brought in. And God doesn't wink at this, guys. Uh, we will all one day give an account for all the things that he has given us, that he's entrusted with, uh, to us. We're all stewards. He said, what do you mean we're all stewards? We are all stewards. God, the things that he gives us, he's going to give an account for that. We're going to have to give an account. Excuse me. We're going to have to go before him. He's going to say, what did you do with the car I gave you, the house I gave you, uh, the money you made, all these things I've given you, your wife, your husband, the kids. As you get older, these are things that you need to be aware of. God's going to give you things. How are you taking care of them? How do you care for the things God has given you? And how do you use them? Are they for your, just your personal benefit or for the benefit of others? Those are some of, the, some of the things that we really need to think about as we get older and mature. You know, and notice here in verses 9 through 16, it says, Then Jehoiada, the priest, took a chest, bored a hole in its lid, and set it aside uh, by the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord. And the priest who kept the door put there all the money brought into the house of the Lord. And so it was, whenever they saw that there was much money in the chest, that the king's scribe and the high priest came up and put it in bags and counted the money that was found in the house of the Lord. I love this because it tells us the king's scribe and, and the priests counted the money together. There, there's accountability. It wasn't just one group counting the money. So they're, they're, they're uh, in a sense, checks and balances. Um, they were checking on each other. Then they gave the money, which had been apportioned into the hands of those who did the work who had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they paid out to the carpenters and the builders who worked in the house of the Lord, and to the masons, and to the stone cutters, and for the buying of timber and hewn stone, to repair the damage of the house of the Lord, and for all that was paid out to repair the temple. However, there were, there were not made for the house of the Lord basins of silver, trimmers, sprinkling bowls, trumpets, and any articles of gold or articles of silver from the money brought into the house of the Lord. But they gave that to the worker, a workman, and they repaired the house of the Lord with it. Moreover, they did not require an account from the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be paid to the workmen, for they dealt faithfully. The money from the trespass offerings and the money from the sin offering was brought into the house of the Lord. It belonged to the priests. Interesting here. Jehoiada had the idea of placing a chest to collect any of the money that was um, collected by the priest. The chest had a hole in it to collect the money. You know, at church we have a similar box. We call it the agape box. Um, and, and we use it so that people can give at any time. Uh, people aren't pressured to give. This is something that they, it's between them and the Lord. No one's standing there looking at them as they put money into the box. It, they can do it freely. And, you know, um, those are the things that... Um, you know uh, that we placed in order for folks who, who again want to give because they want to give unto the Lord and I love it because they're not pressured to do it and just so you know um, you say well what do they do with the money that is collected at church uh, well you know we do kind of do the similar thing we we use the money to re, uh, keep the building in good shape that means there's re always repairs to be made it's used to pay uh, for water, used for electricity, used for gas, used to uh, help clean the building. So it's not like uh, um, someone waves a magic wand and all these things are taken care of. Uh, but really it's supported by the people of God. As they, they feel like this ministry is of the Lord, then they give. And, and that's what we tell people. If you feel like this is a ministry uh, that, that the Lord is in it, then you give. And we're not going to tell you how much to give. You give as the Lord has purposed in your heart. Because then you feel like you're being forced to give. And so you need to keep that in mind too. It's like, you know, whether you continue coming to our church or any church, wherever you feel that the Lord, that the Lord's uh, in the work, then you should give. And as, as the Lord tells you to give, not as man is telling you to give. Okay, that's between you and the Lord. Because after all, 
you're going to have to give an account one day for the money that God has given you and how you use the resources he's given you. We, we try to use the money to further the kingdom of God. This isn't our kingdom. It's his kingdom. The, this, the money that people give is blood bought. Christ died for them. And so there's a heavy responsibility even for those in the church who use uh, those monies that are collected. So uh, in here in verses 10 through 12, um, they would use that money uh, that was uh, set aside for the workers who worked in the house of the Lord. Again, there were carpenters, builders, there were masons, stone cutters. Uh, they paid for the supplies, for the lumber, the stones, and all the things necessary for, for uh, the repairs of the temple. And then also, uh, it tells us they didn't have um, money for some of the items that they used in the temple. But they said, you know what, uh, for right now, the focus is to repair the temple. Once that the temple is repaired, then we're going to focus on those items which will be used in the temple for later use. Now, notice here... Um, also in, in verse 15, which I find interesting is they didn't ha uh, approach the men who were handling the, the money. Uh, they didn't require an account for them because these were trustworthy men. And it's something that spoke to me. Can you be trusted? Can you be trusted? You know, it, it, the things of God, if, if, if whatever the, the dollar amount was given to you, can you be trusted with this? I remember a story um, long ago of a, a dry cleaning uh, business, and uh, this guy was a new guy, and and he was going through the clothes, or getting ready to do the dry cleaning, and um, uh, he goes through one of the pockets and he finds a nickel, and he goes to the owner, and goes, "Hey, I found a nickel um, in one of the the clothes." He goes, "You could stay. Now you can stay." And he looked at him in bewilderment. What do you mean? What he's really saying was, you could even be trusted with a nickel. And I like that story because uh, I want to. I would like to be known that I wouldn't even take a nickel from anybody. And, and and so the question is, can you be trusted even with a nickel, even with a penny? These are the things of God. Can you be trusted with them? Um, now, notice here in verses 17 through 19, the last portion of our study says. Hazael, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it. Then Hazael set his face to go up to Jerusalem. And Joash, king of Judah, took all the sacred things that his fathers Jehoshaphat and Joram and Hezahiah, kings of Judah, had dedicated and his own sacred things and all the gold found in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent them to Hazael, king of Syria. Then he went away from Jerusalem. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah, I'm sorry, Joash, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Interesting. Here comes Hazael. He, he's taken out Gath, and he's beaten the war drum, and, and they know he's coming. And so Joash gets concerned. He gets worried. Did you notice anywhere in those verses that Joash sought the Lord? That he prayed? That he sought the Lord? No, you don't see it, do you? And it's interesting because that tells me a lot about him. As a matter of fact, it tells us um, later on in Second Chronicles 24 um, that when the leaders came to him, the leaders came to him because Jehoiada had just died. And it tells us at that point, the leaders approach, approach him. And at that point, they all forsook the house of the Lord and they began to worship wooden images. And so we could see his, his downward spiral. And as he begins to descend, so does his faith in the Lord, which he really doesn't have. See, if he really had a relationship with the Lord, we would see him seeking the Lord. We would see him asking for his direction to deliver him from the hands of Hazael. But what does he do? He takes all the things that have been dedicated all the valuable things that were in the house of the Lord, even his own house, and he pays off this king. It's unfortunate, because after that, he ends his life in utter failure. So, what can we learn from jo Joash's life? Um, it's not how you start, but how you finish. The starting part is the easy part, right? 
you want to learn how to play piano, you want to learn how to play football, you want to you want to learn how to draw, all those things, hey, in the beginning it's easy. But now when the things start to get a little more difficult, you kind of want to bail out. That's the easy thing to do. And, and we want to jump track. Well, that's not what we should do with the Lord. We want to maintain our relationship with the Lord. Um, sure, the temple got renovated. That was a religious act on his part. He saw it as a good thing. Um, again, he didn't attend temple. He didn't have a heart for God. It was all superficial. Again, these are things that, you know what? God only knows in my heart. People look good on the outside. You know, people come to church. Hey, smile, shake your hands. It's all superficial. But you know what? It's, it's your relationship with the Lord. Not what I think. It's between you and the Lord. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Because if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, this is all superficial. You can play church. So, so gang, listen to me. This is where I'm serious. You need to not only start well, but end well. We want to end well. If you're out there and you're, you know, things were great last year, but you're struggling today, get right with the Lord. Get back on track, and you can. We don't want to end up like Joash. Joash is a great example. He's a great example of where we don't want to be. And so with that, let's pray. Lord, we come to you again in Jesus' name. And I just want to pray for all my little brothers and sisters out there. I pray that um, we would uh, look at Joash's life. And Lord, um, we certainly want to start well, but more importantly, we want to end well, Lord. And so I pray for everyone out there. If, if you're struggling, call on the Lord wherever you're at. Um, you could be in your bedroom. You could be in your bathroom. You could be in the field somewhere, walking, wherever it is. Call on Him and ask Him to, to not only forgive you, but to lead you. And if you're out there and you don't know the Lord, and you're hearing these things, and He's convicting your heart, and you, you, there's something tugging on your heart, and you know what it is. It's Him speaking to you. You could ask Him to forgive your sins. You could just say, Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask you, Father, to forgive me of my sins. And I accept Jesus as my Messiah. And Lord, lead me all the days of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, gang. Well, um, we'll see you next week. Hopefully, we'll be at church soon. Uh, if not, uh, we'll have a Sunday study. And uh, barring that uh, we're still out of church, we'll have another study next Thursday. All right. Lord bless you and hope to see you soon. And uh, again, pray for all of us. We're praying for you. We're, we're hoping that uh, all this will blow over quickly and we can start fellowshipping again. God bless.